see the goodness of the Lord. Do you believe it, church? Amen. I said, do you Amen. believe it? Amen. Listen, we are in the season of favor, yes. and I'm asking you to agree, and let's open up our hearts and our minds yes. and expect good to come. I said, expect good to come. When you get up early in the morning, you walk out that door. Before you walk out that door, say, Lord, I expect something good to happen to me during this season. I expect to be a blessing to somebody during this season. Because see, just like we expected God to do some things for us, he wants us to have a heart prepared and ready to serve and do something good for somebody else. Why? Because we are God's hands and his feet on the earth, aren't we? And listen, he said, I don't have any other hand except yours. I have no other feet except yours. So when we say, Lord, I surrender to you, use me for your glory, sometimes, somebody say sometimes, God's going to challenge you and he's going to beckon you to be the blessing for somebody else. Oh, sometimes you all are a blessing to me. I just celebrated the birthday. And y'all were a blessing to me. You give me cards and gifts and told me happy birthday and all of that. But listen, it reciprocates, doesn't right. it? Yeah. I don't just sit there and say, oh, Lord, let everybody bless me, bless me. But sometimes, somebody says sometimes, sometimes. God's going to nudge on your heart. And I'm like, I want you to be a blessing. Now, somebody over here need this. I want you to be a blessing. I want the church to be a blessing. And what we do, we don't say, oh, Lord, I don't have it. I can't know. Just like God has caused others to bless you and me, we are blessings to somebody else. Amen? Amen. So God bless you this morning. That's why we put our hope in the everlasting God. Amen. Amen. I can say that some more, but our time is moving swiftly, and I got a word. Well, not me. God's got a word for us this morning. He's got another word for us, and so you know what you do. Get on your phone, your cell phone, or your text, and call your friends, and let them know again, your favorite pastor is here, right now, <laughs> and God's got a word for you to encourage you, and to inspire you to expect greater, amen? So God bless you today, thank you for joining in with us, thank you for those that are right here in the sanctuary. And for those that are watching virtually all over the country, we say thank you. Thank you. And if you, if this word and this worship is being a blessing to you and you want to be a blessing to the church, hey, go visit our website and hit that donate button and put your prayer request there and hit that donate button and send in something that will help us to continue to further this gospel of Jesus Christ. Because we've got plenty of work to do and God has called you to help us to do it. Amen. So God bless you now. We're getting ready for the word of the Lord. And the word of God is coming from somebody that's very precious to me. You all may be seated now. The word of God is coming through somebody that's very precious and dear to my heart. No, it's not my wife. She's dear to me too. But this person is dear to my heart. She's our, our precious. Our precious. Our last button on the jacket, as my brother would say. <laughs> her name is Miss Amanda Gladys Hicks. God has anointed her with a word. And I'm asking you, open up your heart. She's a praying woman. She loves the Lord. Not because she's our daughter, but we've seen how God has used her in her life. She's surrendered to the Lord. Well, you know her. She'll tell you. She loves God. She worships God. She loves people and she serves people. And I'm asking you to receive her, an anointed woman of God. Not only does she have her learning, she's educated, but she has her burning spiritually. And I'm asking you to open up your hearts. Call your friends. Sometimes they say, Pastor Hitch, he's up to her, but he's of an older age and he don't understand. Well, I've got somebody that's going to speak to you today that's probably in your age group, our young people. And I believe she will encourage you and inspire you as well. So open up your hearts and your minds of faith. And let's hear Miss Amanda Gladys Hicks as she comes. Amen? Amen? Let's stand on your feet and let's receive her as she comes. God bless you, God. So nice to be 
love. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So I'm going to say a prayer, and then we'll read the scripture, and we'll go from there. So, God, in the name of Jesus. Yes. Oh, man, I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Thank you, God, for this time where we can come and meet together as the body of Christ, Lord to praise your holy name, God, to learn more of you. God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that your presence would continue to fill each of us individually, yes. God, yes. that the word would fall on soft hearts that are ready to hear and ready to listen, that the Holy Spirit would bring back the words that we need to know when we need to know them, God. Yes. I pray that you would speak through me, God, as I go through this, in the name of Jesus, name and that all Jesus. praise and glory would go to God the Father. Yes. In Jesus' name, Jesus. amen. amen. So we're going to jump right on in. Our scripture this morning is coming from Genesis chapter 27. And this morning I'll be reading from the CSB Christian Standard Bible. So I know we normally do King James, but just to give you a heads up, if it's a little different, um, I have a different version. So I am going to read through most of the story in case anybody doesn't know the backstory here. Um, and then I'm just going to focus on a little part. So I'm going to start at Genesis chapter 27, starting at verse 1. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could not see, he called his older son Esau and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. He said, Look, I am old and do not know the day of my death. So now take your hunting gear, your quiver and bow, and go out in the field to hunt some game for me. Then make me a delicious meal that I love and bring it to me to eat so that I can bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening to what Isaac said to his son Esau. So while Esau went to the field to hunt some game to bring in, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Listen, I heard your father talking with your brother Esau. He said, bring me game and make a delicious meal for me to eat so that I can bless you in the Lord's presence before I die. Now, my son, listen to me and do what I tell you. Go to the flock and bring me two choice young goats, and I will make them into a delicious meal for your father, the kind he loves. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. Jacob answered Rebekah, his mother, look, my brother Esau is a hairy man but I am a man with smooth skin. Suppose my father touches me, then I will be revealed to him as a deceiver and bring a curse rather than a blessing on myself. His mother said to him, your curse be on me, my son. Just obey me and go get them for me. So he went and got the goats and brought them to his mother and his mother made the delicious food his father loved. Then Rebecca took the best clothes of her older son Esau which were in the house, and had her younger son Jacob wear them. She put the skins of the young goats on his hands and the smooth part of his neck. Then she handed the delicious food and the bread she had made to her son Jacob. When he came to his father, he said, My father. And he answered, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob replied to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How did you ever find it so quickly, my son? He replied, Because the Lord your God made it happen for me. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come closer so I can touch you, my son. Are you really my son Esau or not? So Jacob came closer to his father Isaac. When he touched him, he said, The voice is the voice of Jacob. But the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he blessed him. Again he said, are you really my son Esau? And he replied, I am. And we're going to stop right there. You all may be seated in the sanctuary. That's an interesting situation. So I was going to try to summarize it, but I thought it would just be easier to read through it. Um, so just a quick recap, what happened? So Isaac and Rebecca are married, right? They are husband and wife. They have twin boys, Esau and Jacob. Esau came out first, then Jacob did. 
But both of them are different, even though they're twins, right? Esau is hairy. He's the one who, like, goes out in the field, and he hunts, and he does all of these things. And Jacob is smooth-skinned, right? He's like they call a pretty boy. He doesn't do all that, right? So what happens is, back in these times, it was really important for the father to give a blessing to his oldest son, right? Before the father died, he blesses his older son. Why? Because his older son inherits pretty much everything and takes his father's place. So everybody needs to know that dad is okay with you taking over before dad dies. So that's what Isaac was about to do. He's old, his eyes are weak, it says he can't see anything anymore, right? And he knows he's gonna die soon. So he's doing things and getting things in order. He's like, all right, son, I'm gonna bless you, but first I need you to make my favorite meal, right? For me, be like, I need you to go get some oxtails, all right? Cook them just the way I like, and then I'll bless you, okay? But the problem is, Jacob steps in and steals it. <laughs> and so Isaac can't see. He's not sure which one he's talking to, but that is the situation, all right? So I'm just going to read our main verses again, which is verse 21 through 24. It says, Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come closer so I can touch you, my son. Are you really my son Esau or not? So Jacob came closer to his father Isaac. When he touched him, he said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he blessed him. And again he asked, are you really my son Esau? And he replied, I am. So today we are going to talk about decision making. How do you make a decision when you are unsure what is the right decision, okay? In this situation, Isaac was unsure of which son he was talking to, right? He wasn't 100% sure. He kept asking him. He was listening to his voice. He's touching his hands, right? He's doing all these things because he needs to make a decision. Now is the time for him to bless his son, and he needs to make a decision. Am I going to do this now with the person in front of me or not? All right, so I want us to talk about what do you do when you're in a situation where you are unsure, right? What do you do if you don't know what job to take, right? How do you make a decision if you're trying to figure out, do I invest my money here or there? Do I do stocks or real estate, right? I don't know. I'm unsure. Um, where do I go? What church do I join, right? Who should I be friends with? Should I travel to Costa Rica or the Maldives? I don't know. I'm unsure, right? There's so many things. Do I trust this friend? Do I go out with this guy? Do I move over here? There's so many decisions that we have to make. What should I do? And sometimes the decisions aren't clear. So we all have these decisions that come up and we don't know how we should make the right decision. And sometimes we feel really unsure. No one wants to be unsure about their life, but it happens. And it also happens in the Bible. So if it's in the Bible, that also means there is an answer. So Isaac is in a situation where he is unsure and needs to make a decision. But what makes this a hard decision is Isaac cannot see. If Isaac could see the face of who he was talking to clearly, this would have never happened, right? But Isaac is blind. So therefore, he doesn't know who he's talking to for certain. There is no straightforward way for him to make this decision. It's now complicated and confusing for him, okay? So Isaac has to use another method to make his decision. Even though Isaac has a relationship with both of his sons and he knows both of them, he's still confused, right? It says he hears the voice of Jacob, which is familiar to him, but he doesn't know that it's Jacob. It says he still didn't recognize him because of the feeling of his hands. So in verse 23, I'm just going to read that. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy, even though he clearly said, this is the voice of Jacob. Okay. So what does he do? He makes a decision. Isaac blessed him anyway, even though he did not recognize him. Therefore, we can assume that Isaac made a decision based on what he felt rather than what he heard. Isaac felt that it was Esau who he was touching, even though he heard the voice of Jacob. And so Isaac decided to trust his feelings rather than what he heard. 
okay? So let's bring this a little bit closer. So when we are in a situation where we're unsure, how do you determine what path to take, okay? The obvious answer is you see the path and you go on it, right? That's what most of us do first. Most of us almost always trust what we see first, right? That's why the Bible tells you walk by faith, not by sight. Because the Bible knows and God knows as humans, our sight is like the most important one. <laughs> you know, it's good to taste and smell, but if I can't see, like, what am I going to do with my life? How am I going to go shopping? How am I going to pick my food? How am I going to drive? How am I going to do anything? I can't see it. You know, so we always choose based on what we can see. If I see the path, I'll take it. If I can't see the path, I'm not doing it, right? That's generally what we do. But what happens when you cannot see the path, right? Isaac was blind. He can't see. So when I'm in a situation where um, do I take this job or not? Well, normally I would just look, but I can't really see clearly. Like for some reason, it's not obvious to me which job is better or which city is better, or which situation is better. I can't see it. So then we have the choice to rely on another sense. You can rely on your feeling, or in this situation, you can rely on what you hear, okay? So, next page. When we rely on our feelings, often we ask ourselves, um, does this feel like a good decision, right? Does it feel like a good decision? Does this feel safe to me? Does this feel like the situation will probably work if I go this way? Does it feel comfortable for me or not, right? For us, we're not going to literally touch the job application, right? We can't do that. But we think, how does it feel, you know? When I'm sitting here thinking about it, does it feel like a good idea? Does it feel like I should do this? Does it feel like it would work out, right? We lean on how we feel. <coughs> we look at our feelings thinking, if I feel this way, it must mean something, right? If I feel this way about the situation, it must be because there's something inside of me that knows something that I don't know. So that must be the right answer, right? For some reason, we believe that our feelings are coming from a deeper well, right? So just because I feel it, there must be something that, you know, inside me instinctively, I really know the answer. I just got to feel it to see which one it is, you know? We think that there's something inside us that knows what we don't know cognitively in our brain, okay? And so trusting our feelings is easy, and we hear it all the time, right? Well, what does your gut say, right? It's a feeling. What do you feel in your gut, right? How do you feel in your heart about this? You know, that's what people will tell you for advice about how to make an unclear decision. And then sometimes, you know, we, we work that way because it works. Like, if I feel hungry, it's because I should eat, right? And so I eat and I don't feel hungry, right? My feeling was true, right? Or if I feel tired, I should sleep, right? So we use these as an example of why our feelings lead us in the right direction. What we fail to realize, though, is our feelings are easily manipulated, okay? So, for instance, sometimes I feel hungry, but I don't actually need to eat. Sometimes I just need to drink water, right? I learned that sometimes your body will make you feel hungry when it's really seeking water, <laughs> Because you refuse to drink water all day, it's like, all right, well, let me turn on the hunger switch, and maybe that'll help me get what I need. But you're not really hungry. You just need water, right? Sometimes your body feels tired because you're not exercising enough, right? If you were to start exercising more, you would have more energy, and then you wouldn't feel tired. Sleeping isn't the only answer, right? But I felt tired, so I thought I needed to sleep, right? But just like that, my feeling was manipulated. And I don't know it. So our feelings are easily manipulated. And the scripture shows us two ways that we often see our feelings manipulated. The first one is our feelings can be manipulated by other people. So I'm going to reread verses 11 and 12 and 15 and 16. It says, Jacob answered Rebekah, his mother. Look, my brother Esau is a hairy man. 
but I am a man with smooth skin. Suppose my father touches me, then I will be revealed to him as a deceiver and bring a curse rather than a blessing on myself. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of her older son Esau, which were in the house, and had her younger son Jacob wear them. Then she put the skins of the young goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Okay. So, Isaac is the person who needs to make a decision, right? He's the one who is unsure. He's the decision maker. But Rebecca's his wife. So Rebecca also has a little bit of skin in the game based off of the decisions that he makes, right? Because I'm married to you. <laughs> so depending on what decision you make, it's going to affect me, all right? What we don't know from chapter 27 is back in chapter 25, right, Rebecca couldn't get pregnant. So Isaac started praying, right? The Lord would help his wife to get pregnant, right? They were getting older. He's like, yeah, we need to have some babies. Like, come on, right? And so when she finally got pregnant and the Lord blessed her, she felt like, oh, like there was a war in her stomach. She didn't know she had twins at the time. So she went to the Lord and she was like, God, why do I feel crazy? And God explained to her, like, you have two babies in there, but one is going to be stronger than the other, right? And the older brother is going to serve his younger brother, okay? So God told Rebecca that. The Bible doesn't say that God told Isaac that. It just said that God told Rebecca because she was the one who went to God and asked, okay? And that's back in 25. So now, when we're at 27, Rebecca has in her mind... The younger son is the one who's supposed to be in charge. So I need to make sure the younger son is the one with the blessing. Because the blessing is the thing that gives you the authority. So Rebecca is now taking it on herself to help push Isaac's decision in the way that she wants it to go. And Isaac doesn't know she's doing that. Right? So Rebecca is literally intentionally manipulating Isaac's feelings Right? Because she knows the only way he knows the difference is going to be he's going to touch him. Like, that's my husband. I know what he's going to do. You know, it ain't no secret. He's going to touch his hands. He's going to smell his clothes. Right? And that's how he's going to know. So she intentionally makes moves so that she can manipulate how Isaac is feeling and Isaac doesn't know it. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, she was like, oh, that's so wrong. That's her husband. Why didn't she just talk to him about it? You know? Why didn't they just have a conversation? It's like, hey, babe, I really think you should bless Jacob instead of Esau because the Lord told me this, right? Why, why, do, why would anybody do the rational thing, okay? Nobody does that. <laughs> Everybody knows I don't have to talk to him about it. I can just make it happen, right? It's quicker. It's easier. If I talk to him, then he's going to have to pray about it. It's going to take him two weeks to fast and seek the Lord to confirm. It's quicker and easier if I just make it happen. Right? Because I already know this is what the Lord wants. Okay? So Rebecca is manipulating Isaac's feelings. And our lives are no different. Okay? So hopefully, God willing, you have good people in your life. Right? And I'm not saying that Rebecca is bad. You know? He chose Rebecca. She's actually pretty awesome. But everybody makes mistakes. And everybody is biased towards what they want to happen. So oftentimes, the people closest to you, when they see that you are about to make a decision, they have a preference as to what decision they think you should make. If Shanique is like, you know what, I'm going to move out, and I'm going to live with some other people, and I'm going to move to Texas, right? Her little brother might be like, I don't like that too much. I don't think that's a good idea. Texas is a long way. I can't get to Texas. I'll never see her, right? So what? Her little brother might start, you know, moping around the house. What's wrong, Stefano? You know, I just don't want you to leave. He's not going to tell her don't go. He's just going to, you know, try and play on her feelings, make her feel bad. You don't want to leave, right? Because he prefers her to stay. The people in our lives are biased, okay? Especially if they have... Uh, like I said, skin in the game as to the decision you make. If what you make is going to affect them, they have a preference. And they're going to tell you. They might tell you outright, but more than not, they're going to try to manipulate you, right? Because manipulation is a higher percentage chance that I'm going to get what I want. And that doesn't make them a bad person, but it's something that we have to realize 
that when you're sitting in your room thinking about, okay, should I move to Texas? And then the thing, oh, but Stefan, he might feel sad. You know, like, you think that's how I feel. I feel that he's sad. But the only reason you feel that way is because he's trying to manipulate you to feel that way. You know what I mean? So you think these are my own natural feelings, but they might not be. They might be feelings that are a result of someone else. Right? So Isaac touched Jacob's hand and he felt the hair. And he was like, oh, because I'm feeling this hair, it must be Esau. Not realizing that, no, it's manipulative. If you would have reached your hand further up his arm, you would have realized the hair stopped. Where did it go? <laughs> right? You stopped growing hair at your upper arm? No, it just is. The goat skin didn't cover that high. <laughs> you know what I mean? But he didn't do that. So he thought, these are my own original feelings, right? This is how I literally feel because I'm feeling it, not realizing that there was a level of manipulation in what he was feeling. You get what I'm saying? So the people around us can manipulate how you feel about a situation. They know what to say. They know where to take you. They know what seeds to drop to encourage you to make the decision that they want you to make, right? So then when you go home thinking, I'm feeling this way because this is how I really feel, you're not realizing how you really feel is exactly the way that someone else wants you to feel, okay? And like I said, this may not be because they're a bad person, right? People Sometimes people manipulate you trying to help you out. Because they think, oh, you're standing in your own way, so let me kind of move some things around to help you get there, right? Rebecca was doing this with the intention of, I'm seeking the will of God, right? God told me Jacob is going to be the one who runs everything. So I'm doing this, doing what the Lord would want me to do, right? Even though God never told her specifically, oh, why don't you deceive your husband and make it happen? Oh, he didn't say that. But she's putting those pieces together herself, right? So it's not that she's a bad person, but she's going about it in a bad way. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the second way that our feelings are manipulated is also by our own expectations. So in this scripture passage, Isaac was expecting to meet Esau. Therefore, he was trying to confirm what he expected rather than give credibility to what he was not expecting, okay? So Isaac knew Esau could not come back that quickly, right? He knows how long it takes to hunt animals where they were living, but he got back quickly. So that's red flag number one. He heard the voice of Jacob. That's red flag number two, right? We got two red flags. But instead of letting the red flag stop him, he instead looked for something to confirm what he was expecting which is when he's like, all right, let me touch you, right? And the one touch confirmed that it was Esau. So we have two things that says it may not be him and one thing that says it could be. But in verse 23, it says he blessed him anyway, right? Even though we have two against one, he still started the blessing anyway, okay? So... Isaac was relying on his feelings that he didn't realize he was manipulating himself by his own expectations, okay? Because he was expecting Esau, he started looking for something to confirm that this is Esau, rather than just looking straightly, objectively at the facts, okay? So how do we see that in our own lives, right? Um... So if I am like, you know what, should I date Chase or not? I don't know. I'm unsure. I don't know, right? And so I'm expecting Chase to meet me at 6 o'clock, right? We're like, okay, we'll set a date. Let's go. But then Chase doesn't come, okay? He didn't show up. I didn't get a call from him. He didn't text me. That's so rude, Chase. I don't know why you treat me like that. But he doesn't show up, okay? And so now I can look at the evidence in front of me or... I can say, well, because I was expecting him to come, I might start making excuses like, well, maybe something happened with his little sister, and that's why he couldn't come, you know? And if he's carrying her, he can't text me while he's carrying her in his arms, you know? Like, you can't do two things at once, right? So I start looking for something that would confirm the expectation that he should have been there. 
rather than looking at the fact that he didn't answer, he didn't text me, he didn't show up. You know what I mean? And when I start looking for those excuses, it makes me feel better, right? Because then it's not about me why he didn't show up, right? Not that he just doesn't like me. You know, I don't have that. So I feel better about it. Um, or what's it not like? Okay, so if you want to go buy a car, if you're expecting the car dealer to be an honest and upright guy, right? When you go to shop for the car and he tells you this is the final sale, you think, oh, this is the final sale. This is the final day of this offer. So I feel like I should just buy it now at this price because he told me, like, I'm expecting this to be the final sale. I'm expecting him to tell you the truth. Instead of, like, calling your uncle who says, girl, please, when you go to a car dealer, every day is the final sale. You know, if you come back tomorrow, they'll still have the same sale. <laughs> if you come back two weeks later, the sale might be lower. Like, don't rush. It's fine, you know? But I'm not thinking about that. In the moment, I'm expecting him to tell me the truth. I'm expecting to walk away with the car. So I feel like I should just buy it now, right? He says it's the final sale. I should just do it, right? Because of what I'm expecting and what I want to do, I tend to fall in the place of my feelings instead of just looking at it objectively based off of what I've heard or what I know to be true. Does that make sense? So when you're making a decision that you're unsure about and you say, all right, I'm going to see how do I feel about this? Maybe that's not the first place you should start. Okay. Why? Because the people around you might be manipulating your feelings. You might be manipulating your own feelings. Can't really see the situation objectively. Right. And feelings, if you don't know, I hate to tell you, feelings are fickle. Right. Today, I might be feeling that dress tomorrow. I might not. And I can't even tell you why. <laughs> but I just don't feel it anymore, right? So why am I making a decision based off of my feeling that may not stay, right? I feel like I like this job. And then three weeks later, nah, I ain't feeling this job. <laughs> I don't feel it anymore, right? Your feelings change. So when you are in a situation where how do I make a decision and I can't see the path, I wouldn't advise that you rely on your feelings as the next step. That would not be my advice. For Isaac, it didn't work out too well. He picked the wrong kid, but we'll get there, right? So a more reliable option to rely on is what you hear, okay? So it was funny because literally the other night I was sleeping and like I heard something and it woke me up because I'm not a heavy sleeper. And I'm like, what was that? And then I stopped and listened, but I didn't hear it anymore. So then the question was like, well, did you really hear something? And I was like, no, I heard that. Like, I wouldn't be awake right now if I didn't hear something. You know, like, I heard something. I can't tell you what it was. I don't know, maybe it was at the neighbor's. I don't know what it was, but I know I heard it, right? You just know we heard it, right? Because my ears, I believe they're telling me the truth. And your ears tell you the truth most times. What you hear is pretty upright. But we're going to talk about that. So. In our scripture, it says that Isaac heard the voice of Jacob. Mm -hmm. He was like, you sound like Jacob. You do not sound like Esau, right? But he didn't trust it, right? But what he heard actually was true. That's the one he should have trusted. He should have trusted his ears in this situation because his ears were telling him the truth. So what you hear has more validity and more reliability. And we actually know this because scripture backs it up. So there's not a lot of scriptures that say, oh, just go off how you feel. Actually, there are no scriptures that say that. <laughs> but I did look up how many scriptures talk about hearing, and there was a column, a full column in the back of my Bible with scriptures that use the word hear, hearing, heard. It's very prevalent. So a couple of examples. John chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. Right? Jesus says um, that the sheep know the voice of their shepherd, right? And so if the voice of another shepherd calls them, they will run away, right? The sheep know who is the true shepherd based off the sound of the voice, okay? In Hebrews chapter 2, it tells us to pay attention to what we hear so that we don't drift away from the faith, right? It doesn't say pay attention to how you feel so you don't drift away from the faith. It says pay attention to what you've heard and you won't drift away. Right. Philippians chapter 4 and 9, it says, practice what you have heard and what you've learned, and the peace of God will be with you. 
So if you want the peace of God, practice what you heard, not what you felt. What you've learned, and most of our learning is going to come from hearing, right? Because we come to church. And that's how you keep the peace of God. Romans 10 and 17 says, faith comes from hearing, and what you are hearing must be the word of God, right? It doesn't say you have to feel the Bible, right? It doesn't say the Bible's always going to make you feel good, and then you're going to have faith. No, it says you have to hear what it says. And once you hear what it says, you will have the faith, right? And so that's just a few examples, okay? So hearing is actually a lot more important. And this principle applies to our natural life too. So when we find ourselves in front of a situation and we're like, okay, I am unsure of what to do. I can't see the path. Amanda told me or the Bible told me that I shouldn't rely on my feelings. How am I supposed to hear the answer, right? I'm not telling you that the voice of God is going to come down in the thundering cloud and tell you, pick this job, right? That's probably not going to be what you hear. Actually, I'm 99% sure that's not going to be what you hear, right? But the situation will speak for itself if you're listening, okay? So what do you hear about the situation and what do you hear from the situation, okay? Those are the things that we're looking for. Why? Because we know that the scripture tells us from the abundance of your heart is what your mouth speaks, okay? So when somebody says something and you hear it, that's more true, right? People can't change their hearts. Only God can change a heart, right? He's the only one. So if they're speaking something and what they spoke come from their heart, that means it has to be the honest thing. People can, like I said, they can change their actions, but what they say is going to be a little different. So what's an example of that? All right. So an example of listening to a situation is, all right, there's a guy. I won't use you anymore, Chase. We'll call him Bob. All right? There's Bob. Me and Bob are dating. I'm like, okay, well, should I like, should I get serious with Bob? I don't know. I can't really, I don't know. I'm so unsure. Ha, 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 ha. Right? So I go to Bob's mom's house, right? He's like, oh, come over. And he buys me flowers. I'm like, oh, Bob buys me flowers. And then I hear his mom say, <laughs> Bob is so cheap. Why would his mom say that? I don't know. I don't know his mom. You know, we've just been dead. I mean, I haven't seen him be cheap. You know, he's bought me things so far, but why would she say he's cheap? Right? That's an idea of listening to the situation, right? Bob clearly is not going to tell me that he's cheap. Okay. <laughs> right? He's trying to win somebody. He's not going to do that. But if I don't listen to what the situation is sounding like, his mom might be trying to tell me something, right? And then if I'm like, oh, she's probably just saying that, whatever, she bought me flowers, it's fine. I feel good about the flowers, you know? I feel good about Bob, he bought me flowers. And then you keep going and then, you know, six months out of the line, he's not still buying me flowers. Bob, why did you stop buying me flowers? Maybe you buy your own flowers, don't you have a job? Excuse me, Bob, right? And now the cheap side of Bob comes out, okay? But Bob's mom, she knew he was cheap the whole time, right? But I have to choose to listen to that, okay? Um, if I'm trying to decide what job I should take, right? I don't know, I don't know. Well, did you go online and read reviews? You know, like, did you ask the person who interviewed you, how long have you been working here? You know, what's the environment like on the job? If they're talking around the question, well, you know, um, the environment is like any other job. It's, it's fine. Okay. Or they're saying, you know, this is the best job environment I've ever been on. Like everybody really gets along and I've been here for seven years. Okay. Right. What did I hear from you? Okay. Because what I feel about the job could just be based on how much they're paying me. Well, this job is paying me more, so I feel good about it. Let's go. Right? But that might not be the right answer if the environment is uh, very depressing. I'm not going to want to stay there even if they are paying me more money, right? And my feelings put me in the wrong situation. But now I can't quit the job because I don't have another job and I still need the money. And now I want another job that pays as much as this job since I took this job. And now I raised my bills. I started buying more stuff because I thought I'd have more money, right? And now I have this whole new situation of trying to leave this job that I don't like. Where if I would have just listened at the beginning and heard what they were saying, maybe I would have made a different decision. 
right? So those are just like a couple of examples of like, how do you listen to a situation? Not just go off, how do I feel about it? Okay. So in verse 24, I'll read it again. This is after he said that he blessed him. Again, Isaac asked, are you really my son Esau? And he replied, I am. But as we know, he was lying. So sometimes as Christians, when you have to make a decision, you feel a hesitancy, right? And the hesitancy is mostly because you're unsure, but sometimes it's there for a reason, okay? It might be like when you have, when you feel hesitant about something, it's often a warning from Jesus, right? As Christians, if you don't know, let me tell you, right? When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, right? He's like, okay, all of your sins are gone. You now have the righteousness of Jesus. So that is your ticket into heaven. Just don't lose it, right? Don't act crazy. But we'll talk about that later, okay? So you have a ticket to heaven. But the thing is, Jesus died on a cross, not just to get you a free ticket into heaven, <laughs> right? He died on the cross so that while you live this life, it can be an abundant life. To make you a whole person emotionally spiritually physically like financially everything he wants you to be good so jesus sends us the holy ghost and so the holy ghost job is to comfort you right to guide you to convict you right he's the one who lights the path so we know which way to go so as a christian if i find myself in a situation where i'm unsure and there's a hesitancy, like, I want to make the decision, but like, Isaac, I want to, are you really sure? You know, I keep asking that question. And it's not because of a thing, it's just, I don't know what it is, but I'm not sure, right? I'm hesitant, right? I can't put my finger on it. I can't tell you what it is. It's just, there's something that every time I'm about to do it, I get a stop, right? Sometimes that's the Holy Spirit trying to keep you from making the wrong choice, right? The Holy Spirit lives in you. So the Holy Spirit knows you can't see. <laughs> he knows how you're feeling. He knows what the situation looks like. But he also knows what is the right choice. So sometimes when we're like Isaac and we feel hesitant, like I'm ready to move forward, but I'm still asking the question, are you really sure? Check with the Holy Ghost and say, all right. Holy Spirit, I'm ready to move, but I keep hearing this stop sign. What is it? What do I do, right? Make it clear for me, right? Read the Bible and let him confirm the go or the stop, because he will, right? He's not about you being confused. That's not the Holy Spirit's job. His job is to make the path clearer. So you go to him and say, why do I feel hesitant? Because when I was ready to jump, I just, that's just something, I don't know. You know, like, you keep that unsure feeling a lot of times at the Holy Spirit. But hesitancy cannot be confused with fear. Okay? Fear is something different. So in this passage, Isaac was not afraid to do the blessing. Okay? Like that wasn't his problem. He was just unsure about who he was blessing. But he wasn't afraid to do it, right? So sometimes when we're looking at a situation, the reason we stop isn't because we're unsure and hesitant. It's because we're afraid to move forward, okay? And that's different from being hesitant, okay? So afraid means what job should I take? But I'm scared to take a job because I don't know how my life is going to change. And so now I'm scared to do it. So now I'm not making a decision because fear is there, okay? So how do you know the difference between I'm actually afraid to take the next step versus something is hesitant, right? If something is hesitant, a lot of times you can't put your finger on what's stopping you, right? It's just this, eh, something's not right, okay? Fear oftentimes comes with excuses, it comes with negotiations, and it comes with just wasting time, right? If you're doing any of those three things, you're afraid to do it, <laughs> right? So. If I'm making an excuse like, you know, well, I don't want to, I don't want to get that job because, you know, um, it's on the other side of town and my car is really old. What if my car breaks down on my way there and then I'm late and then they might fire me? Like, oh, that would just be a bad situation. Maybe I should take that job. 
that's an excuse. Okay? Like, has your car broken down any time in the last three months? No, but it could. That's an excuse. Okay? Um, negotiating. You know, like, um, well, I was going to go out with you, but I'm unsure. You know, I'm actually just afraid to go out with him. Well, if Okay, how about this? If you can meet me at 12 o'clock, no, 12.05 exactly with purple roses, then I'll go out with you. Why are you trying to negotiate this? <laughs> because you're scared. <laughs> like, I'm trying to negotiate something because I'm scared. I don't really want to do it. So I'm putting these conditions on, hoping that you don't meet them so I don't have to do it because I'm really scared to, right? That's fear. Or if you're just wasting time, like, um, yeah, I think, should we join this church? Yeah, we should join the church. Let's join it next Sunday. Okay, next Sunday comes. Are we going to join the church? You know, I think we should wait till um, after Mother's Day. I think that would be a better time to join. Okay. All right. Um, well, no, actually, I'm going to be out of town, so can we join? We'll just start for the new year. We'll just join the church in the new year. You're wasting time. That's fear. Okay, like any of those types of situations, you're not making a decision because you're afraid, right? It's not because I'm scared to make, you might be scared to make the wrong decision. And that could be the fear that's stopping you, right? It could be. But fear should never be the driving force for anything. In our lives as Christians, fear should never be what you're using to make your decision. And in those examples, you're using fear. Right? I'm making excuses. I'm trying to negotiate something. I'm just putting it off, putting it off. Right? Fear is making my decision of not making the decision. And by not making the decision, you are making a decision. <laughs> that I'm just going to sit here and deal with it. That's the decision you make. So do not complain when you're like, well, I should get a job with more money. Well, you had an opportunity to make a decision to get a job with more money, but you were too afraid to do it because you didn't know what the job was going to be like. And what if the more money comes with more problems? You know that song, more money, more problems. That was an excuse. You're afraid. So you're still at the same job, making the same money, and it is what it is. You made a decision with fear, and that's where you are, right? So fear and hesitancy are two different things, right? Hesitancy could be the Holy Spirit trying to slow you down because he knows, oh, there's something that you don't see, but I see it. Fear is me slowing myself down, right? Wasting time, making excuses, trying to negotiate something that doesn't need to be negotiated, right? That's kind of the difference. Does that make sense? Okay. So, some examples of people who made decisions based off of fear. So in Judges chapter 4, there's a guy named Barak, and the prophetess Deborah tells him, hey, pretty sure God called you to help save Israel. And he was like, yeah, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> but he decided to negotiate. He's like, but if you come with me, then I'll do it. Because he was like, oh, Deborah, she's a girl. She ain't going to come. And she was like, all right, I'm coming. Because Israel still needs to be saved whether you're ready to do it or not. I'm not afraid. You the one over here scared, right? And they do it. But he negotiated with her. Why? Because he didn't want to. He was scared. God told him to do it, and he didn't do it. So Deborah had to come over there and tell him, you still need to do this. God is still calling you, right? But he was wasting time because of fear, right? Another one is Gideon. Gideon was afraid. God called him, hey, you're going to fight the Midianites. You're going to win. Israel's going to be saved. He's like, he started making excuses. But, you know, I mean, what about, you know, we heard about God, but he's never done anything lately, and I'm not really strong, and, you know, I'm not sure about this. He starts from making conditions. All right, well, I'm going to put a fleece out. I think he put, like, two or three fleeces out, right? <laughs> Wasting time because he was scared. In the end, he did it, right, which is a good thing, but he was wasting time out of fear. It wasn't because... Something bad was going to happen. God already told him, you're going to win. Nobody's going to die. Everything's going to be fine because I'm going to do all the work. I just need you to go up front and do it, right? So there's different examples in the Bible of people who were fearful to do something versus examples like Isaac who he was hesitant because the Holy Spirit was trying to tell him, that's not the right son. Well, not the Holy Spirit. He didn't have the Holy Spirit. But in our case, it would be the Holy Spirit who's trying to tell you that's not the right move. Okay, so in the end, if you are not familiar with this story, 
uh, verse 32 and 33, Isaac does end up blessing Jacob under the deception, right? So Jacob gets the blessing. Esau comes back after hunting. He makes the food. He's like, hey, dad, I got the food. I'm ready. And his dad was like, who is this? He's like, this is Esau, your son. And it says, 33, Isaac began to tremble uncontrollably. Who was it then, he said, who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it all before you came in, and I blessed him. Indeed, he will be blessed. Oops. So Isaac realizes, I blessed the wrong son. My bad. That's the Amanda version of the Bible, right? But he's trembling because he knows that wasn't what I was, that's not what I meant to do, right? That's why he's trembling. If he had made the right decision, he wouldn't be trembling, <laughs> right? But he's trembling because I did not intend to bless Jacob. I intended to bless Esau. And now Esau is in front of me and there is no blessing for him. And you can't like go back and undo it because Esau's like, well, just bless me too. Like, it's just a couple of words. Just tell me. He's like, I can't do that. That's not how this works. You know, like your brother's got it. He's got it. It is what it is, okay? So in the end, from our perspective, Isaac made a mistake. He did not realize that his mistake was part of the plan of God. So, like I mentioned before, Rebecca heard from the Lord that the younger son would be over the older son, right? As we know, we're already uh, past this point. So the lineage is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? That's what God intended the whole time, that Jacob was going to be the one whose name changes to Israel, who's the father of the 12 tribe, who then Jesus comes from many years later, right? That was the plan the whole time. But Isaac didn't know that. And so I say that to say, even when we make a mistake or when we make the wrong choice, God is able to redeem our choices, right? The blood of Jesus redeems all sin, even the sin of mistakes and wrong choices, okay? So sometimes you're going to be in a situation, you're unsure, you can't see the path, and you will make the wrong choice. That's going to happen. But your mistakes, God has already accounted for them, right? There's nothing that you can do that can mess up God's eternal plan for the world. <laughs> you know, like, you can't. You make a mistake, you say, God, I'm sorry, that was the wrong choice. I'm over here trembling because I didn't realize it's your own choice. But God can still redeem it, right? He can still use the choices that you've made that were wrong for his glory and for your good, right? Yes, you might have some consequences, okay? In this case, um, if you keep reading, Jacob and his brother did not get along uh, for many years. And then later on, Jacob was deceived by somebody else because... He was deceiving his dad back then, right? So what goes around comes around, right? You still have to live with the consequences of your actions, but Jacob's life was not derailed because he deceived his dad, right? God still had a blessing for him. He still chose him. He still changed his name. He still made him the father of many nations, right? He is still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? God did not X out his name because he did something deceptive. God did not X out Isaac's name because he blessed the wrong son, right? Both of them are still in the plan of God and God redeemed their choices and still gave them the life that they were purposed to have, right? Which is a good life. So I say that because when we do make the wrong choices, it's gonna happen. Don't be discouraged, right? It's okay. You live with the consequences and believe that God is for us. So even our wrong choices cannot be against us, right? When God loves you with a love that is more than love, your wrong choice isn't going to stop that. Mm -hmm. So he will redeem all of our choices to fulfill his will in our lives. Yes, we will have to live with the consequences, but in the end, the plan of God is fulfilled. Just like it was fulfilled through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it can also be fulfilled through us. So when God is for you, not even your bad choices and mistakes can be against you. Amen. Amen. That's what I have. So I'll go ahead and say a prayer, and then we'll do offering. God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, God, that you are the everlasting God. You are the same God who is with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are the same God who is with us today. God, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who helps to lead us and guide us into all truth. But God, we also thank you for the redeeming power of Jesus. 
because in our humanness, we still make mistakes. We still fail. We still rely on our feelings more than what we've heard, God. We still find ourselves in situations that are not ideal. But Lord, I thank you so much that the blood of Jesus is able to redeem even our bad choices, even the things that we've done wrong intentionally, God. You can still redeem them and turn them around to work out for our good and to fulfill the plan that you have for our lives. So we thank you, God, that our hope will forever and always rely on you and not ourselves. We thank you that you have called us and chosen us, God, to be a part of your body. And we pray that as we move forward, we would use these words to bring glory and honor to you and all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give Amanda a hand, and she gave us such a, a great message on today. An excellent, excellent message. Um, so, so much that was in there. There was a lot of stuff. Hopefully, you guys were able to grab a lot of that. And you know, one thing that that stood out, a couple things stood out. But one thing that stood out is that you know, as old as the Bible is, the Bible's been around for so long. This was a perfect situation about uh, a family that was really kind of messed up. You know, the wife is deceiving the husband. The son is deceiving the father. The wife and the son are deceiving the brother as well as the father. I mean, it shows that, um, you know, messed up family's been around for a long time. <laughs> it ain't just your family or my family. Anybody else's. This, this stuff been going on since the Bible days, you know. And um, so as messed up as it was, it still turned out for the good. It was messed up and and oh, later on, the brother wants to kill the other brother. I mean, it was just all kind of mess. But, uh, you know, we, we think sometimes we think we're the only ones that have been through stuff and our family got to be the worst. All you got to do is read the Bible and you'll see a whole lot of uh, situations that are probably way worse than whatever your family has ever went through. So, amen. Uh, we're going to get ready to do our offering. So as we prepare for that. Um, for those who are online and watching uh, through Facebook Live or if you catch it on YouTube, if you want to give, you can go to centerfaithchurch.com and you can uh, donate there, whether it's your tithe, offering, or sacrificial giving. Uh, we appreciate that. We appreciate everybody here that's giving. Uh, a quick thing as we get ready to do our um, financial confession in a moment, you know, uh, I, Isaac sent Esau off to, uh, you know, get the, get the game and get the food so we can come back and be blessed. And, you know, Esau took time because he had to, you know, catch the whatever he was trying to catch, venison, I think it was deer, whatever he was catching, had to catch it and then prepare it or whatnot. But, uh, you know, Jacob got there first. You know, Jacob got there first. He did it in a deceitful way, but he got there first. And because he got there first, he got the blessing. Yeah, he did it in a messed up way, but he got the blessing. And I say that to say, you know, I, I, we've been talking about, and pastors been talking about how we're in a season of favor, and, and, and you know, this is this is that time. You don't want to be the last one or miss out on the blessing that God has that's here right now. That if you sow in now, you can attach yourself to the blessing. That's what the Bible talks a lot about, is the blessing, and the, the message that Amanda gave was perfect and right on time, talking about how, hey, when there's a moment, there's a blessing there, and the man of God says that there's a blessing, you need to react on that. Because if you're not ready and you take the time and you're slow, you may be like Esau and show up and be like, sorry, sir, your time is up. We told you all this time what was going on, and then you wait till three months later and wonder, you know, how you might have missed it. So let's not miss out on the blessing as we get a chance to sow into the kingdom of God and, um, and help bless the people of God. Amen. Amen. So we're going to do our financial faith confession together, and then we are going to give. So the financial faith confession says, Father, I now purpose in my heart to offer my financial gifts in support of your kingdom. Your word tells me in Deuteronomy 28 that your blessings in abundance shall be mine when I am consistently faithful and obedient to your commands, which include my financial gifts. I anticipate your provisions, wisdom, and guidance as I seek after you in good times and bad times. I believe your word, and I ask you to manifest yourself in my life as I become a doer of your word and not just a hearer. Amen.